Holly Cotton here, and today I am joined with Victor V.C. Caldwell, and V.C. is a Grammy award-winning jazz gospel music producer. We're going to talk about all of the other things that he does, but basically today we're going to get his life story. We're going to hear about all of the things that he's doing, all of the projects, all that great stuff. So welcome, V.C. Thank you for having me, Holly. Good to be here. Yes, yes. So first, what I always do is I read people's bios and I kind of get a little bit of information about them. And so uh, whenever we talk to Christian artists, there's always this pull from growing up in the church. And when I was reading about you, there was something interesting about your father and the legacy that you have. So can you start off telling us first about your father and what he did and then how that paved the way for VC to be invented? Okay. <laughs> well, my father, uh, Reverend Virgil Caldwell, he was a minister, but he was also a musician and he was a band teacher. So for the most part, we heard music all day, every day around the house. Mere fact that he's a musician. And um, I started playing probably around five, six years old, started playing piano. I have an older brother. He was already playing piano. So I'm hearing it from him, hearing it from my dad. And the fact he was a band director, you know, I would hear those, that thing also, just hearing the band play. And my father also played in the church. So he was not only in the pulpit preaching, but he would come out of the pulpit and go to the piano and play for the choir or the choirs. So I'm pretty much hearing it all the time. So, you know, I took uh, kind of the typical, most people start out on piano and then you gravitate to something else as you get bored with one thing after another. Moved to trumpet at some point, like in uh, middle school. Uh, Bounced back and forth between piano and trumpet, kind of quitting one, going to another. I got high school, started playing the bass guitar. And that's the one that I pretty much kind of fell in love with probably more than anything. But, I, you know, I played some other instruments in between, saxophone, uh, some clarinet, different things. But when I got hold of the bass, that seemed to be the one that I just really took hold of and I dug in on my own without someone trying to motivate me or push me. I motivated myself at that point. So that's kind of how I started with music. But it was just hearing it all the time in the house or anywhere we would go as a family, church, wherever it happened to be. So that's the start of it, so to speak. And my brother still does the same thing. So I'm still hearing it all day long. So how does how do you start with playing an instrument to actually becoming a producer? How does that transition happen? Because, you know, I played the piano. Uh, I took, well, just let me not go that far, but I dabbled in the piano growing up, but it was never something that I was like, oh, I want to start being a producer of, of, of other music, ensemble. So how did you make that transition from loving music to actually being a producer? I never actually saw trying to be a, a producer or saying that that's what I wanted to be. He, I just kind of moved into it from loving music, listening to other musicians play and just watching what they would do. And I just kind of gravitated into that, you know, over time, it's not like when I first started playing music, I said, I want to be a producer, because actually I did. If there was anything that I really wanted to do that just hit me all of a sudden, it was be an audio engineer. And that hit me around 11th mm -hmm. or 12th grade. I wanted to be an audio engineer, but I was already playing instruments and music. And I had even dibbled and dabbled in trying to write songs at that point too, since I was playing. So as I progressed and went to college, and studied audio engineering, I started working with other classmates in college and we were, you know, just doing what we do, doing projects in school, writing songs. I was engineering songs, but I was also playing on them. So 
to some degree, I was already producing in some sense in all the different things that I was doing. So it was almost like a natural progression, if anything, more than me just saying, I want to be a producer. I just kind of progressed into it by doing all these other things. And it naturally kind of occurred to me. Mm, okay. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Okay. Okay. Thank you for breaking it down. I'm always curious about, you know, how we start off with these passions in life and then poof, all of a sudden it looks like you did something overnight or you just roll into that. But I mean, I, I love that, that, uh, example that you gave that that really wasn't what you were seeking, but it sort of sought you out. So that makes perfect sense. And I just wanted to also mention some of the things that VC has worked on. So he's worked on, with Whitney Houston on the Bodyguard movie soundtrack, CC Winans, a uh, Grammy Award winning album, Alone in His Presence, Donnie McClurklin. He's also worked with TD Jakes, Andre Crouch, the Clark Sisters, Yolanda, Absent, uh, Yolanda Adams, BB Winans, Smokey Norfolk, Brandon. Uh, Brandy, Take Six, The Winans, <laughs> so many, so many people you worked with, all the letters are, are bunched up when I'm reading it. So I know that that's also exciting too, because like you said, you didn't plan on doing this. So let's just use one of the bigger projects that you, that you've worked with. So how did it feel when you were invited or, or whatnot to start working with one of these these people give us an example of uh, tell us a story about when you got a call or something because it's got to be like almost surreal that you're going on about your life and then someone's like hey you want to work with Whitney Houston and you're like uh yes <laughs> last question that's going to be kind of a, a fun fun question so I know that you have numerous awards that you have won and everyone kind of you know Grammy is like the the one that you when you're in the music industry, Grammy is the one that everybody's like, oh, if you're in music, you have to have Grammy. So can you tell us how it felt when you found out that you were one of those people that now have a Grammy? So all I can say is, it's, you know, it's a great feeling, you know, to have a Grammy. But after you've gone through so much of the music uh -oh. business and all of the ups and downs in the music business, all of the the drama that's in the music business, it almost just becomes, okay, is that, is that all it is? But then again, you know, it's, it still felt good, you know, to receive a grandma or any other awards, Dove, Stellas, or any award you receive, it's good to be acknowledged for what you do. But at some point, at least for me, at some point you get to a level where you say, okay, it's great to have the award, but is that my reason for doing it? what I do. For me, it's a, it's a calling that I have on my life. So whether I get this plaque or some of the things you see in the background, you know, some of those nominations or, or some actual awards, it, uh, the bottom line is, am I doing, uh, serving the purpose that I need to serve? That's the bottom line for me at this point. But I mean, it, it feel good. But once you think about the travel, the road travel, it's like, okay, well, <laughs> I guess it was worth all of that pain and drama that I had to go through to get this because life goes on. I hate to be a a downer on a, a so a, a up topic, but you know it's it's like walking to me. You just get up and you don't think about the steps you're gonna take. It's just what you naturally do because that's what you've been doing all your life. It's no different than doing what you do. It's somewhat natural, and that's what you do, and you just you don't think much about it from interviewing one person to the next. I'm sure it's like, oh, okay, it's what I do. All right. So, last question, VC. Okay. I want to know how we can support you. What projects you're working on now? What future projects you have? And go ahead and drop any of your social media, website information, all of that. Uh, well, obviously. The ultimate support is buying the CD because <laughs> it's it's out. It can be purchased on uh, on all the uh, the streaming uh, sites and for purchasing sites. But also, you can purchase it at my website, which is uh, 
Let me see if I can get it right. BCCarwellMusic.com. That's my website. So all of the same music can be purchased on the website. Uh, as far as uh, future projects, believe it or not, even though this second project came out, fully came out, end of April, I've already started on number three. And I, <laughs> I've, I've just because songs just happen. You know, it just, I, I feel something, I hear something. You just, I just start writing songs, regardless if it's for me or for someone else. But this particular one I've already started was actually for me. So, and I haven't even played the other two out anywhere yet. So, you know, so I'm just, I just write music and I just keep writing music because I never know where it could possibly be placed, whether it's my CD or maybe some other artists might want to tune. I mean, because I'm still playing on other people's records. I get calls and I play on people's records all the time. They send me files and I do bass parts here and those, those types of things. So uh, that's what I'm doing, you know, uh, in the meantime. Uh, but the website is the, is, is the place to go to find out what, what's going on in my in my musical life, I guess. And like I said, it's on, you know, Spotify, Apple Music, all those <laughs> places that people go in buy their music. And as far as playing out, you know, Okay. Got a few things probably in the summer that I'll be doing, like uh, a few festivals, like the uh, WC Handy Festival that's in Alabama. I've done that a, a few times over the past five years, you know. So that's that's one place I'll probably be going. So I'll show you this. I've got just in case you haven't seen it. I'm sure you have. Whoops, that's the first one. I'm sure you. That's the first CD. Mm -hmm. and that's the second one, the one that you talked about. Did I have it up right? Yeah, I have it up right. And uh, of course, the third one, not the third one, but the one that's my daughter's project, that's her project. So that's those three. And she's working on new things herself, you know, but uh, she's she's in Atlanta. She's working on things down there. And she's doing sessions. And so she's doing her thing and I'm doing mine. And we talk on the phone and c collaborate here and there. And I'm still working with other people, still working with Kirk Whalen on things here and there, his brother, Kevin Whalem, and just numerous artists, you know, as they call. And I'm a mastering engineer, so I master a lot of people's records also. So I am I wear four or five hats, and I think that's one of the reasons why I'm not bored. <laughs> I'm not bored because I don't, I'm not just a musician, I'm an audio engineer, a master engineer, I'm a songwriter, I'm an arranger. So I, you know, I don't have a nine to five schedule. Every day is slightly different than the last day. So I am never bored. Well, and not only. Fortunately and unfortunately. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, also a fellow uh, multi-hat person. But not only that, but I think not just necessarily the being bored report, but I think that helps with your longevity in the field. Like you said, this is 40 years that you've been doing this and you're still doing it. You're still doing projects. You're still doing new stuff. You're still finding artists. You're still, you know, so it's like, there's never a, a downtime and, and it's because you're, you've mastered doing all of these multiple traits, you know, so I'm uh, not traits, trades. So you've mastered all of these. So now you can have expertise about a bunch of stuff. So again, it's why you stay relevant all, all of this time. I love it. I love it. And also I wanted to say too, because I did listen. Well, well, oh, go ahead. Oh, well, one thing I could say at one point I was becoming bored because I was only doing one thing. When I first uh, started working here in Nashville, this was in 1983. I was uh, an engineer, I was like a second engineer. And I was working like 12, 14 hours a day. And I was, I did that for like two and a half years straight. I was, you know, getting burned out because that's all I was doing. And that's when I kind of stepped away. I didn't step away from engineering. I just stepped out of a staff engineer's job and said, I need to kind of turn this into freelance and start pursuing all the other things that I wanted to do. And that's when life just kind of uh, opened up, so to speak. I mean, it got scary to some point, too, because now I'm trying to figure out how do I keep money steady coming in. When I had a staff job that was paying me a salary, then I went to being a musician on the side, playing whenever I could get a gig, getting engineering gigs when I could on the side, or writing with people or doing demos for other people. It became all freelance. It got interesting 
but it got scary at the same time because I was trying to always figure how am I going to pay bills without a steady check. So, yeah, the the boredom went away, but I got some other things that came along with that that I had to deal with. So, right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what life. <laughs> I love, I love that you were like, all right, now hold on, let me just add this. When you have multiple jobs, it comes with multiple work. You know, when it, when when you're doing other stuff, and everyone asks me the same thing. Like, I'll say something new that I'm working on, and and people will say, how did you find time to do that? And I'm like, I didn't find time. I made time. When you were you're in that grind mode, you 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 make it happen. There's, you know, you're, we're not sleeping eight hours hours a night every night so I love that that you mentioned that and I also love like I was going to say earlier and and I forgot but I wanted I I did listen to the the samples of your of, of your song your new song and I love that they they do have like a jazzy sort of of undertone to it because I know a lot of times whenever everyone thinks of, okay, you know, Christian music, it, they're, it's going to be Kirk Franklin or it's going gonna, it's gonna to be, you know, super, super, super animated or something. So I love that it has like this soothing jazz undertone. So is that kind of your genre? Is that, is that which, which your, which, which your albums are more of, of those undertones? My, my, well, when people ask me what kind of music is, which that's the question everybody asks, what kind of music is it? I just tell them it's good music. But I come from a background of my dad was a big band lover. So we're talking Duke Ellington, Benny Goodman, you know, that kind of style of music. So I started there, but he was also a church musician also. So he played hymns. So I, I'm I'm kind of a cross between all of that, plus the R and B that I grew up listening to, you know, back in the day, and the jazz that I listened to. I'm I'm kind of a combination of four or five different styles of music all in one, and I don't necessarily take it out because I'm working with this particular artist or put it in because of this artist. I just let come out what comes out. So it might you might hear some undertones of jazz, but you might hear undertones of gospel here and there. I played on reggae records. I listened to a lot of different music. So it just all comes out all in one. So I, that's why I tell people when they ask me what kind of music do I play, I say it's good music. You know, my 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 important part about my music is the lyrical content. I just want to make sure that it's something that will hopefully move you in being a better person, if nothing else. You know, because, I mean, instrumental music is great, but once you put a lyric on it, where am I leading you? Or, or better still, where am I not leading you? you know? So hmm. my, my whole thing is, is really about the lyric. I love you know, that, you know, Victor. But, you know, I, that's a good... I love that. I, that's, a, <laughs> that's, a very, that's a very unique and genuine answer. So I, I love that. I love that. Yeah, right. Like, music can do whatever, but... What about the lyrics? What is it saying? Hmm, I like that. <laughs> well, I mean, this is what this is what I, I have found that people you have people who love country music, and that's all they're gonna listen to mm-hmm. for the most part. You have people who just R and B, and that's where they stand. You got people who love jazz. If it's not jazz, they might not have listened to. It. So, I've been fortunate enough to be able to listen to all of this and kind of mesh it all into one. Now it's like, okay, I can listen to him because I I hear the hints of jazz. It might not be all jazz to them, but it's enough jazz for you to listen to it. But the bottom line to me becomes, okay, now what am I saying? What am I talking about? And I think we have enough music out there that's leading people to do a lot of negative things. So some of us got to do something else. Right. We got to do something that helps people live better, act better, treat other people better, you know, feel better, you know, if possible, you know, so I'm, I'm one of many who I think are trying to do this, you know, but like I said, it's a calling on my life and that's what I'm doing until I can't do it anymore. 
<laughs> there you go. There you go. So it, it was such a pleasure, VC. Thank you so much. That is Victor VC Caldwell, everyone. Make sure you support, get his album, support his daughter, support all his projects. So thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Thank you for allowing me to share. Uh you call me anytime. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be glad to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay.